Glory. Amen. Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of God this morning. Mm -mm -mm. We've been examining a subject of, of scripture reflecting the Father. Reflecting the Father. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. Matthew chapter 28 verse number 18. Mm -mm. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Next verse. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Next verse. Teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. We are exploring the concept of the fatherhood of God. The fatherhood of God. One of the things we said was that Jesus was always teaching from Genesis to Malachi. Jesus' is teaching notes were Genesis to Malachi because when Jesus was preaching and teaching the word there was no book of Matthew Mark Luke John there was no Romans Colossians Ephesians so his teaching notes were always from Genesis to Malachi and we took time to clear the concept of saying Old Testament Genesis to Malachi and New Testament Matthew to Revelation and we said that didn't come from the Bible because that's not the way the Bible is segmented it was added by the privilege of translators. We said the Bible is a book, one complete book. One complete book. And you're supposed to read all of it together. We read the Bible together. We said also that the word of God is the whole book. The whole Bible. The word of God began in Genesis. When brother John was giving his own summation of the word of God, he says in the beginning was the word. And he was referring to Genesis. So the word of God is from Genesis to Revelation. And that's what we call the gospel. We study the Bible and we find out God's plan. So we said Jesus was always teaching from what we refer to now as the Old Testament. He was always teaching from those books. Beginning at Moses, which is the Old Testament or what we call the Torah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, I mean, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The background of the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is the three books of John. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you must understand 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. The key to Revelation is 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Because John wrote the book of Revelation and established the doctrine of explaining Revelation from his epistles so to understand it you must read those three books we also said that the background of the epistles of paul is the book of acts you must read the book of acts to be able to understand the pauline theology of the pauline epistles then we also said that the background of the book of acts and all the epistles is the four gospels you read the four gospels to be able to understand the book of acts and the epistles then the background of the four Gospels is the prophets, minor and major prophets. They are the backgrounds of the four Gospels. Then we said that the background of the prophets is Exodus to Deuteronomy. To be able to understand the prophetic books, you have to read Exodus to Deuteronomy. Then we said that the background of Exodus to Deuteronomy is Genesis. And we can break Genesis into bits. All right, so to understand Exodus to Deuteronomy, you must understand Genesis. To understand the prophets, major and minor prophets, you must understand Exodus to Deuteronomy. To understand the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you must understand the prophets. And then, of course, to understand the book of Acts, you must understand the four Gospels. And to understand the Pauline theology, you must understand the book of Acts. To understand the book of Revelation, you must understand 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Now, Genesis can be broken in bits. We say Genesis is about the promise that God made 
to Abraham. If you remember last Sunday, I told you that the book of Genesis is the promise of God of an exodus. Genesis is God's promise of an exodus. So, the book of Genesis therefore contains the promise that God made to Abraham. And that promise starts from chapter 11 of Genesis to the end. Chapter 11 of Genesis to the end. Actually, specifically, chapter 12 of Genesis to chapter 50. So, the background of chapter 12 is chapter 3 of Genesis. Because chapter 3 of Genesis is the problem. The problem of man. The fall of man. In chapter 3. And then in chapter 12, God makes a promise of how he will reconcile man back to himself. Alright, so the background of chapter 12 is chapter 3 of Genesis. Chapter 4 is the history of the problem. Chapter 4 to 11 of Genesis is the history of the problem of man, which is the fall. Then chapter 12 is God's promise. And that promise pans to chapter 50 of Genesis. Now, please stay with me. Chapter 11 ends where they began to worship idols. Genesis 11, it ended with idol worship. The building of the tower of Babel. And God said, no. They want to make a name for themselves. They want to make their name great. So God says, I will make my own name great by walking through Abraham. I will walk through Abraham and make my name great. The background of all of this is seen, S I N, seen generally. Now, in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, is the solution of the problem in Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 is the solution of the problem in Genesis chapter 3. So, Moses also was not writing, remember everybody, that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, was Moses' teaching ministry. And Moses was not writing to you. He was writing to a particular audience. And if you remember a few months ago, I told you, to be able to understand what Moses was saying, you must sit where they sat, and you must hear what they heard. You must sit where his audience sat, you must hear what his audience heard, to be able to understand what Moses was teaching his audience. You cannot stay in a different audience. And you cannot stay in a different time and season. And understand what Moses was saying to a different audience in a different time and season. It's important that you must situate yourself within that congregation that Moses was talking to. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, which is what we call the Torah or the, the, the five books, the Pentateuch. Now, stay with me. So, to be able to understand what Moses was saying because he was writing to the nation of Israel who understood his language, with whom they shared the same culture and background. So since Israel shared the same culture and background with Moses, they understood his communication style and they understood his mode of communication because he spoke to them in a language they will understand which requires interpretation today. Sometimes when I talk to people and I try to explain the Bible to them, instead of them coming down and, and you know, intelligently paying attention, they allow their religious minds get in the way. And then they want to interpret the Bible with the background of CRK. The CRK they learned in school. And CRK is not accurate Bible teaching. CRK is just history. Bible teaching is revelation knowledge. Because the word of God is bigger than literature. There's a revelation behind the writing of the scriptures. Are we in the building? So sometimes when I talk to people and I try to teach them the word of God, they allow religion get in the way. They forget that the audience that the Bible was written to, that audience is not today's audience. However, because what was communicated is eternal truths, eternal truths, it does not expire with a time gap. They are truths that are eternal. It means it affects us today. Therefore, we need to go back to where the audience sat, sit where they sat, hear what they heard, to understand what they understood and apply it. 
You cannot apply without understanding. That's why the word of God is taught. The word of God is explained so we can arrive at an understanding. And somebody came on social media and responded to a teaching I did and he said, I do not agree. That's all. And I said to him, it was not taught for you to agree. The word of God does not need your agreement. The word of God is supposed to confront your thinking process. And you are supposed to submit your thoughts to the authority of God's word. So you don't have to agree with what we teach. Rather, you humble yourself and follow seeking to understand. Because the essence of Bible teaching is not agreement, it's understanding. That's why Philip, I mean, Philip will ask the eunuch, understandest thou? He didn't say agreeest thou. He says understandest thou. Because a genuine and honest person does not approach the word of God seeking to see if he knows it. He approaches the word of God as like a learner who is willing to travel through in a bee to understand. So that the eyes of your understanding are enlightened as you follow humbly. And then suddenly your eyes are open to see what was communicated in those scriptures. Now, stay with me. So, the scriptures therefore has to be carefully examined. Moses was teaching an audience that understood him. He can't use your culture today to have taught his audience then. Because your culture today was not in existence. He couldn't have used your communication style today to teach his audience because there was nothing like that. For example, look at this. For example, today, when it rains very heavily, we say it rained cat and dogs. And when we say it rained cat and dogs, it's a figure of speech for meaning the rain was very heavy. Now, if I were to write a book today, and in the course of my writing, I added, and on my way to Calabar, it rained cat and dogs. And because of the severity of the rain, I couldn't drive very fast. I had to drive slowly because it was raining cat and dogs. And instead of driving for an hour or two, I made it in five hours to Calabar. Now, so somebody is reading that piece of literature I, read, I wrote today in 50 years time from now. At that time, maybe the word cat and dogs will no more be a figure of speech in use. If a young boy or a young girl at that time picks up a book, that book written by me, and in the course of reading, the child sees it rain cat and dogs. The child will think cat and dogs were falling from the sky. Except somebody who was there today when I wrote the book is there at the time that boy is reading to say cat and dogs is a figure of speech for the severity of the rain. That will be the boy receiving interpretation of my writing from someone who sat where I sat, who had what I was saying within the audience of my communication to interpret in 50 years time the import of what I was communicating. So when the Bible was written, there were figures of speech used that were common in their day that are no more common in our time. So when you read, if you do not have an interpreter who interprets the scripture, you will carry figures of speech and run with them literal. And you will be making a blunder in the application of scripture. Is it clear? That is why there is the need for interpretation. Can you imagine many years ago, just before us, 2,000 years ago, actually 2,000 years ago, Jesus was teaching and Jesus didn't teach literal. This is 2,000 years ago. Beginning at Moses, 2,000 years ago, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted. So if 2,000 years ago, Moses and the prophet had to be interpreted, is it 2,000 years after, there will be no need for interpretation? I mean, 2,000 years ago, Jesus had to interpret Moses to his audience. How much more today? In fact, today we need much more interpretation than they needed 2,000 years ago. Am I communicating at all? Because English has grown, communication has grown, 2,000 years ago. So that's why there's the need for Bible teaching. 
There's a need for Bible interpretation. And that's what I do here, all the services. When we come here, I take the time to interpret the scriptures. And in the interpretation of the scriptures, revelation of God's word comes alive. And the scriptures come alive. Now, please pay attention. God inspired Moses to write. So God makes his word relevant and applicable today. In spite of the fact that we were not Moses' immediate audience. That's why he brings teaching pastors who identifies what identifies our world and there's precise theology. So that's why the study of God's word is not proper to just select verses scattered and just throw them anyhow and quote them. The scriptures must be read together. You must read John and Lamentation together. You must read Isaiah with Ephesians. You must read Ephesians with Genesis together. You must read Colossians with Psalms. And you must read Psalms with Jeremiah. You must read Jeremiah with Exodus. Exodus with Hebrews. They must be read together. So that is exactly what Jesus did in Luke chapter 24, verse 25 to 27. The Bible tells us, he told them on the way to him, I was all full slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded the word diharmonia interpreted unto them in all the scriptures. The things concerning himself. Are you still here? So first thing he says what, what the prophets have spoken. Prophets here refers Genesis to Malachi. 27 all the scriptures in all the scriptures. What's about him? What's about him in all the scriptures? His death? Not only that, but the circumstances of his death, which includes betrayal, murder, eventually, sacrifice, defamation, slander. They even killed Jesus in the name of God. They killed Jesus in the name of God. Which means all those misrepresentations are part of the facts of the gospel. So as you read those misrepresentations in scriptures, you are reading the facts of the gospel. Jesus therefore says all that the prophets have spoken. Now look at that Luke chapter 24 verse 44. Luke 24 44. Mm -mm. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Next verse. Then opened he their understanding, dinogio in the Greek, that they might sune me, understand sune me, the scriptures. So one understand is dinogio, the other understand is sune me in the Greek. But can you see, in the Greek there are two different words, but in English is one word. So you need to be, you need interpretation. If not, you would think understand is understand. But understand is not understand. Because one understand is dinogio, the other understand is sunemi. Understand dinogio means their minds open for the first time. Bam! To the facts of scripture. How? When Jesus sunemi. Sunemi means putting the facts together to arrive at destination. So when Jesus put the facts of the scriptures together and arrive at destination, they are understanding for the first time, split open, and they now knew what Jesus was communicating. Putting the facts together. Putting the facts of the scriptures. All things must be fulfilled. So I am the one that things were written for, that is why I came to fulfill it. Now I have fulfilled the scriptures, meaning everything the scriptures foretold was my death, burial, and resurrection. It's the same story. E.W. Kenyon, a theologian I respect very well, said, the Bible is written in the light of our redemption. The Bible is written in the light of our redemption. That is, there's a common light it is the light of our redemption. It opens with redemption 
and closes with redemption. The Bible opens with redemption, Genesis 1, 1, 2, and 3, and closes with redemption. And that is how we think. So, all the facts that Jesus used and taught of in the four Gospels, were they innovated? Huh? Were they innovated? No. Are they found in the Old Testament? Yes. So if God is not father in the Old Testament, he cannot be father in the New Testament. That means the fatherhood of God spans across the scriptures. That God is father is not a New Testament reality. It is the reality about God from Genesis to Revelation. That means therefore... If God is father in the New Testament, it is because it has been taught in the Old Testament for the sake of this teaching. If God is father in the New Testament for the sake of this teaching, means he is father in the Old Testament. So, there's no distinction whatsoever. There is only explanation. Explanation. So, last week we began, I mean, in the first service this morning and last week, we began to examine the concept of the father. And we looked at Abraham and then we began to see God's promise to Abraham. In the first service, we did quite some work. I will encourage you to get the teaching of the first service so that it was set for you a proper foundation for what I'm going to be saying in the next few minutes in this service. If you're with me, can I hear a powerful amen? Now, so God's promise to Abraham is a covenant. God made promise to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2 and 3. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2 and 3. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Next verse. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that cursed thee. And in this shall all families. If your Bible is mine. I will underline families. In this shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God made promise to Abraham. God made a covenant to Abraham. Why is it a covenant or a promise? Because all God required from Abraham. Was for Abraham to be an ally. For Abraham to say, I believe. Now, the reason why it is a promise, it is because it is epangelia, the Greek word. Epangelia means a self-fulfilling promise. God made promise to Abraham that only God will fulfill. A self-fulfilling promise. So question, who is the father of many nations? In the first service, we established that the father of many nations is God. Through whom is God going to walk that promise? Abraham. Now, in their culture, in the culture that Abraham functioned under, I explained that before. And you need to understand their culture. Today in our cult, various cultures, whether it is the Bibio culture, the Yoruba culture, the Hausa culture, the Igbo culture. We have our... Now, some of the traditional rulers we have today did not originate today. Our traditional institutions have lived for eons. Okay? But over the years, they have become weaker and weaker. Back in the days, when a traditional ruler says a word, it's a law. Back in the days. And that's why the Yoruba people have what they call kabiesi. Okay? Kabiesi. Meaning, you are final. What you say is final. Okay? And the, the Igbos have theirs. The Ibibios have theirs. The Hausas have theirs. Even when you go to the traditional ruler's palace, the, the way they adulate them, the kind of words they use in adulating them, they make, them, they, they make it sound like you live forever. Your kingdom lives forever. You are a deity. 
Your word is final. In Hausa, they have it, you know. They, 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 they tell the kings, whatever you say is said. Your word is final. He said, your shoes are like brass and iron. When you step in a place, nobody can move your leg out of it. They have such adulations for kings. And we're used to it in our various cultures as Africans, all right? So, in Abraham's culture, it was like that. They had traditional institutions that were like final authority in those cultures, all right? Now, it's like in the kingdom of Eswatini. That is a typical kingdom in today's world. If you've been to Eswatini or the place where they call Swaziland, I've been there. It's called the kingdom of Eswatini right now. And they say every year, if the king is having a celebration and people come out to dance, and the king just look at any woman, whether it's somebody's wife or a girl, or once she's a woman, and the king say, that one, that's all. That one. From that moment, she has become his wife. Nobody can stop it. They will just package and deliver. That one. Because he owns everything in the kingdom. He owns the people. He owns the wealth. He owns the land. That one. That's it. Whether she likes him or not. Whether the parents agree or not. It's final. Okay? It's a kingdom. And in a kingdom, the king owns the domain. Gradually, democracy came in and civilization is overriding some of those. But some of those kingdoms, there are a few of them that are still in existence. So you can imagine 200 years back how the world operated with kings in charge of do domains. If even till today in places like the kingdom of Eswatini, the king still has such level of influence that he can just say that one and it is done. Okay. So you can imagine back in the time of Abraham. So God wanted to walk through Abraham. He had to come into Abraham's culture to understand. So to understand the meaning of the words that God spoke to Abraham, you have to go to history to understand how they were absolute sovereigns. Those kings, they were absolute sovereigns. Now, the concept of names, please listen carefully now. The concept of names and name change and name use was in Abraham's culture. The concept of names, change of names, use of names was in Abraham's culture. Where those names connote what a deity was doing. So because they used to worship idols. Abraham came out of an idolatry background. So when he was given the name, his name was called Abram. Abram means exalted father exalted father or father of heights Abraham father of heights now when a name is given it is used in the worship of a deity now Abraham had believed God but he's still maintaining that name and God has no problem with his name as Abraham at all okay this one that people tell you, if your name is, uh, is darkness, you better change your name. If not, your life will be darkness. That's not true. There are people whose names is failure and they are successful. And there are people whose name is wealthy and their poverty has no definition. So that can't be true at all. God has no problem with your name. In fact, it means nothing to God. Lazarus means prosperous. Lazarus in the Bible. It means prosperous. But where was he? Eh? At the gate of the rich man, begging for crumbs, yet his name was Prosperous. So names mean nothing. Don't let people confuse you. See an old man of 50 changing his name and declaring in the newspaper because a pastor told him your name is your problem. All that is, is, is village ideologies. They have no scriptural depth and they have no spiritual relevance. And don't let anybody take advantage of your lack of enlightenment and make caricature of you. God has no problem with your name. Even if you change your name to wealth or money, it doesn't bring it into your hands. Is it not true? One of the men that rule America, his name is Bush. Eh? How can Bush be the, in charge of the most powerful nation in the world? But it happened. Even his name was, Jude, was Bush. And in fact, two Bushes. <laughs> is it not true? Two Bushes ruled America. Are we teaching here? 
If you know the meaning of some of the richest people on earth, the name, meaning of their names, you will be baffled. And yet some people that are carrying very fantastic names cannot pay transport fare. They cannot pay house rent. So leave that thing. Leave that ideology. The concept of using a name in that format, that concept is a man-made concept. Man-made concept. And it has its origin with Abraham. So by God saying, you will now be called Abraham, not Abraham. Because that's what people say. Okay, if God doesn't care about the kind of names you use, why did he change the name of Abraham? Why did he change the name of Peter? Your name shall no more be called Simon. Your name is now Peter. Jesus was communicating. It was a teaching lesson. Same thing with Abraham. Now, so Abraham's name was changed from Abraham to Abraham. God is coming down to man's level. That change of name is an indicator that God is coming down to man's level. It's like, okay, let me use a language you will understand. Let me communicate with you, Abraham, in a language you will understand. Remember in Exodus 3, 13 and 14, when Moses said, what name do I call you? What will I tell Pharaoh? Who will I tell Pharaoh has sent me? What do I tell the Jews? Who will I say sent me? You don't name God. You don't name God. You don't call God by a name. He is God. He doesn't have a name. No name fits him. Because of his weight and size, there's no vocabulary that can label him. You can't you can label God. What do you want to call it? What in your vocabulary? What weight of description or what weight of articulation do you have in your vocabulary as a man that labels God? You can't give God a name. That's why in the Bible, all the people that attempted to give God names, the names were endless. Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Nisi. Another person, uh -uh, it's not Jehovah Nisi, it's Jehovah Sid Keno. Another person, no, it's not Sid Keno, it's Shama. Another, no, no, it's not Shama, it's Shalom. So, no, it's El Gibor, it's El, 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 El Leon. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's Jire. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Rafa, Makedesh, Rama, Rohi, Ro, Rofa. Uh, they kept calling names endless. Because they can't name God. You can't give God a name. When Jesus came, Jesus said, let me help you. Because I am God in humanity. Father. 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 They couldn't think of him as father. Our father. Our father. Abba. Giving God a name means you are trying to distinguish him from others. Who are the others? Who are the others? If I call you now, I'm trying to distinguish you from this crowd. Is that not true? That's why you have a name. So that you have an identity to be distinguished with. God has no body. He is alone in his realm. So you can't give him a name. The idols in your village have names because there are idols all over the world. And recently in India, a lot of idols have been disowned. A lot of Indians brought out their idols and threw away and said those idols couldn't protect them from coronavirus. So they are useless idols. And more and more they will throw away the idols. Because the gospel is penetrating the nations. The light of the gospel is penetrating countries. If you're hearing me shout, I hear you. That's why we've got, to, we've got to preach it more than ever before. We've got to shout this gospel on the mountain top. So that men who sit in darkness will receive the entrance of God's light. You can label God. You can distinguish him. God in his faithfulness and graciousness looked at Moses and said, you are asking for my name. So you want me to give myself a name that you can use. Okay, no problem. My name is I am that I am. I am that I am. I will be what I will be. Ayadaba. Ayadaba. I am that I am. 
I will be what I will be. If you're in the first service, you know where I'm going now. Uh, yeah, I am that I am the almighty Shaddai, the double-breasted God, the self-sufficient one. I am sufficiency. I'm sufficient all by myself. So I will be what I want to be when I want to be for whatever purpose I want to be. If I, if I need to be a man to save man because I am self-sufficient, within me are the resources to be a man. If I need to be Holy Ghost to live inside man, I have the resources to be Holy Ghost. At the same time, I am God. At the same time, I am the Son. At the same time, I am the Spirit. I am self-sufficient. Oh, glory to oh God. I feel like I'm teaching. If you're catching my flow, shout glory. The I am. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. Yahweh. Ego am I. In the Greek. Now, stay with me. So the concept of even allowing a name is in God's mercifulness. The concept of God even allowing you to call him with a particular name. <laughs> it is in God's mercifulness and graciousness. Where God accommodates what we think. Where God accommodates how we do things to yet carry out his will. Stay with me. So here in this culture, names therefore connotes a message from deities... Or a message by deities. So why did God do this? He did this to reaffirm his promise. His name change was not the promise. The change of Abraham's name was not the promise. But the change of Abraham's name was the reaffirmation of the promise. Genesis 17 verse 6. I want to read to verse 10. Genesis 17, 6 to verse 10. Now, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Next verse. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto them, and to thy seed after thee. Next verse. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land, wherein thou art a stranger, and all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Next verse. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep. Between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. So God gives Abraham a sign. Remember what signs are. Remember what signs are. A sign is not the promise, but a sign is a pointer to the promise. A sign, when you hear signs and wonders, signs and wonders are not the promise. But signs and wonders are used to point to the promise, which is the destination, which is the end of the matter, which is Christ himself. Now, the word changes there, A-B, herb, father, is to reaffirm what he had promised to do. So, the concept of God as father is in his promise. The concept of God as father is in his promise. So it is therefore not correct to say God is only called father in the New Testament. It is not correct to say that. Because by the promise he made to Abraham, it means that God wanted to be called a father from Genesis. From the beginning. God has always dreamed that he will be called a father. That has been God's design. And for God to be called a father means God will have a family. The father and his family. That's been the ultimate dream of God. And that's what the Bible is about. 
the Bible is about the father and his family and how the family came about. How the father eventually arrived at his dream of having a family. That's what the Bible is about. Now, by the promise of Genesis 1, 26 to 28, the promise there, using the phrase image and likeness, God created man in his image and likeness. It means God wanted to be called a father. For God to create man in his image and likeness means God wants to be called a father. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Now, by the promise he made to Eve, Genesis 3, 15, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent means that God wanted to be a father. So in the promise of the Messiah, Isaiah 9, 6, that same promise God made to Eve in Genesis 3 is repeated in Isaiah by the prophet. Chapter 9, verse 6. Now don't forget that every time Jesus is teaching, he's teaching from where? Genesis to Malachi. If God was not father in Genesis to Malachi, he cannot be father in Colossians. He cannot be father in Ephesus. He cannot be father in Romans. Whatever God is not in Genesis to Malachi, he cannot be in the epistles. God did not transform into a father. God has always been a father. That's why in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, put it up for me. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's called Everlasting Father. The meaning of everlasting is now and after. Everlasting. Now and after. The question we should have asked is, who are his children? That's the question. If he is father, who are his children? So, in the promise God made to Abraham, he said, I am sufficient to do. The self-sufficient one. I am sufficient to do what I will do. Which means, in the promise made to Abraham, he will be father, and in that promise, he will be son. In the promise God made to Abraham, within that promise, God will be father and God will be son. So God is both father and son. Now a carnal man can't understand what I've just said. God is both father and son. Remember, he's the almighty. Remember, he is sufficient. So it means he is both father and son. Stay with me. How can God be father and son? I don't believe that. Well, if you don't believe that, that's your problem. He is God. He is almighty. I don't view God in the eyes or with the eyes of an idol or with the eyes of man. I view God as almighty. Whatever he says, he has the resources to do it. And he has the integrity to do what he says. Remember, he has the resources and he has the integrity. So if he says it, it is done. When God speaks, it's as good as done. Even if he delays, within what he has spoken is the ability, capability and resources and capacity to bring what he has said to pass within what he has said. He does not say and depend on external things to make it happen. No, when he speaks it, his words are containers of the resources, capacity, capability, and ability to make what he says happens. So self-contained in God's word is his sufficiency and ability to make his word not fail. That's why God's word is a pangelia. It's a self-fulfilling word. Teaching good. No, he doesn't say... Uh, this will happen. Then he says, please make it happen. No. <laughs> when he says, this will happen. In this will happen are the resources and ability to make this happen. Did you understand? Yeah. Yes. That's why he calls it a covenant. 
Now, covenant is a word in Abraham's culture. Remember, God wants to walk through Abraham. So he steps down into Abraham's culture as the Almighty. He steps down into Abraham's culture to carry Abraham along. Since they are going to work together as allies. Oftentimes, when a weak nation in Abraham's culture, please, I need your attention. In Abraham's culture, oftentimes, when a weak nation and a strong nation will come together, the strong nation will bear the identity of the weak nation. And the weak nation will bear the identity of the strong nation. Now, in their own world, the stronger nation may take advantage of the weaker one in their own situation. So God used a language Abraham understood. And that language was the language covenant. Because covenant was common in Abraham's culture. We are weaker nations went to stronger nations and said to stronger nations, let us cut a covenant. It's called cutting a covenant. And by cutting a covenant, we will be your blood brothers and you will be our blood brothers. You protect us and we work for you. So the weaker and the stronger. It was natural in Abraham's culture. That's how people function. So God now wants to carry Abraham along, but Abraham doesn't know God. And Abraham needs to understand what God is communicating. So God comes down into Abraham's level and says, I want to make a covenant. And Abraham will understand the word covenant because it was common in his time. That what God was saying is, I the stronger want to protect you the weaker. And I want to take your identity of the weaker on myself and give you my identity of the stronger on yourself. That's what God was saying to Abraham. Okay, now, stay with me. If you observe, it was not Abraham that initiated the discourse. It was God who initiated the discourse. If you observe, Abraham is busy worshipping moon and star and having a good time with his idols. God walks to Abraham. Abraham, get thee out of your father's land. Get thee out of your home to a land that I will show you. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will make you a blessing. Just like that. Just like that. I should just get out. What have I done? The Bible says, and Abraham believed. And Abraham left his father's house because he believed. Why did Abraham believe? Because God communicated to Abraham with a language you could understand. And what was that language? Covenant. Abraham departed. There was no argument. Meaning Abraham understood. So today, if we want to teach you what happened, we have to take you back into that audience and use their language, explain it to you for you to see what actually happened. And that's exactly what I'm doing. So Abraham believed God and obeyed. And because Abraham believed God, all his sinfulness was canceled. And because he believed God, God called him righteous. Because a righteous God can only do business with a righteous man. So for God to do business with Abraham, he looked at Abraham and said, you don't have what it takes to be righteous. So I, God, I will use your faith in me as a criteria for righteousness. Since you have believed you are righteous, irrespective of your weaknesses and mistakes, I won't count your mistake and weaknesses, I will count your faith. So faith is righteousness. So with God, the highest standard of morality is faith. God's definition of morality is faith. God's definition of morality is not good behavior. It's faith. God called Abraham righteous. Now question, did Abraham make mistakes after God called him righteous? Yes. Did he de-righteous him? No. Because his righteousness was not predicated on good behavior. It was predicated on faith. Now unto he that walketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. The word ungodly in the Greek is criminal. God is the justifier of the criminal. His faith is counted as righteousness. Faith is righteousness. That's the highest form of morality in the sight of God. Faith in Christ. Teaching good this morning. 
Is it good to be moral? Why not? Why not? Morality is good. I mean, when you believe in God, you receive the life of God, the power of God, and then you begin to do good works. You don't do good works to be accepted by God. No, you are accepted by God the way you are with all your dirtiness just because you believe in Jesus. Now, once you believe and God accepts you, he puts his life inside you. He puts his ability inside you and he puts his DNA inside you. Now, as you begin to grow in the knowledge of what has happened inside you, that knowledge begins to change your lifestyle. It begins to change your behavior. It begins to change your conduct. So it's not conduct first. It is faith first. Then that faith brings you to a place of acknowledging. And acknowledging begins to effect the change. I'm preaching good. God punish the devil. Stay with me. I'm almost done. God said, Abraham. Abraham said, yes, sir. This is what I'm going to do. I want to father every nation. Now, God and Abraham are talking as allies. Because Abraham has believed. Abraham is righteous. So, righteous is talking to righteous. Abraham, yes, sir. I want to father every nation. And I want to do it through you. Abraham said, done. <laughs> We're allies. Done. Kataba. Then Abraham said, but, but how are you going to do it? God said, don't worry. I'm able to do it if you just believe it. The resources are not coming from you. I have all the resources. All I want from you is belief. Abraham said, I believe. God said, done. Teach him. So Abraham said, no problem, I believe. It's easy. He is not going to do anything now. Hey, Abraham is not going to do anything. All Abraham is going to do is believe. To show you that Abraham is not going to do anything, what God will do will not be through Eliezer, the servant. What God will do will not be through Ishmael. It will be through Isaac, the miracle. Yeah. Isaac is the miracle because Isaac came from the dead. Isaac came from the dead. Abraham is dead. Sarah's womb is dead. And Isaac comes out of the dead. Why? Because God's family will come out of the dead. From death to life. The day you believe the gospel, you pass from death to life. Just like Isaac. Just like Isaac. Just like Isaac. From death to life. Teaching good. So God is able to do what he has promised to do. So Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 calls him mighty God. The word Gibor. It means a mighty one. He calls him prince of peace. Prince here is Saul in the Hebrew S-A-R. It means a ruler or a commander. But notice what he commands. He commands peace. The rulership of God in Christ commands peace. Not die. He's the prince, the ruler of peace. He's not the prince of war. He's not the prince of death. He's not the prince of destruction. He's the prince of peace. That is the government of God in Christ brings peace. There's no death in God. There's no killing in God. So which means this counters their day. Because when you mention a king in the days of Abraham, it implies violence. It implies destruction, tyranny, rulership, and forcing men. And then now a new king is being introduced who is a king of peace. So it's counterculture. It's counter-narratives. 
and his counter lifestyle. He doesn't stop there. The prince of peace emphasis. Now look at that Isaiah 9 7. I like to read it as I begin to round up. Are you blessed in this service? Isaiah 9 7. Mm -mm. 9 7. 9 7. Isaiah quickly, quickly is on the computer. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment. Observe the word judgment there is the word mishfat, mishfat, all right, in the Hebrew, and justice. The word justice there is where you have the word righteousness. So he is going to do this, and if you observe, he said, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this, meaning. He's going to do this as a passion. As God will do it zealously. The word righteousness, the way we see it is not the way it is in the Bible. It's not like I'm a sinner and now I am a saint. That's a narrow way of seeing it. Righteousness is used in the Hebrew as justice. Justice. What is justice? To be in the right. To put things in the right place. To be in the right. To put things in the right place. And God is saying, I will do through Abraham. And what I will do will be righteousness. It's justice. So whatever God will do to the serpent. Will be righteousness. It will be justice. And justice is righteousness. The seed of the woman shall bruise. So the seed of the woman bruising the head of the serpent is righteousness, is justice. Whatever God does to the work of the devil will be justice and it becomes a gift to us in the resurrection of Jesus. Now, he says he will sit on the throne of David. Remember, David is that king who knew that he was not the king. That's why David will say, the Lord said to my Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. <laughs> Covenant City. Good to see you. Man. Bless you. Bless you. Man. The Lord said to my Lord. David acknowledged a king that was bigger than him. Sit on my right hand until I make. You know, Jesus asked them. David, in the spirit, called him Lord. If David is his father, why does David call him Lord? And they could not answer. The Bible says from that day, nobody asked him any more questions. They permanently shut up. Because, ah, they were busy bragging. He hey, hey. said, okay. David in the spirit called him Lord. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, if he is David's son, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They knew him as son of David. Okay? So, if I am son of David, and all of you are looking at me as the son of David, why does David in the spirit Call me my Lord. Bible said they kept quiet from that day. What Jesus was telling them is, I am before David. Before the ancestors of David I have been. Before Abraham, I am. So even Abraham, I predated him. Before Adam and Eve, I am. So Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the I am. When Moses say, who are you? What should I tell them? Who should I say send me? Tell them, I am that I am. Then Jesus walked on the earth and he said, before Abraham was, I am. So, you know what they understood? That's why they took stones to stone Jesus. What they understood is that, so you are the one that appeared to Moses as God. So you like this, you are the God. They carry stone. Yeah, but that's who he is. He is the I am. There is no I am outside Jesus. 
Jesus is God Almighty. Anybody that doesn't believe that is not a Christian. He's not a Christian. He's in another religion that uses Bible. I mean, of you know, it's not only Christianity that uses Bible. Occultic people use Bible. There are religions that use Bible. I hope you know that. Yeah. But if you're going to be a real Christian, then Jesus is God. And outside Jesus, there is no God. Hallelujah. He is the I am. He is the I am. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Yeah. I am that I am. I will be what I will be. And see him traveling through Abraham, through Adam and Eve. Promises. Walking through Exodus down to establish his fatherhood and produce a family. Now as I close this service, for Jesus to produce, for God Almighty to produce a family, God became son. Remember, he is both father and son, the Almighty. <laughs> Woo! You know why I laugh like that? Religious demons are vomiting already. They can't stand what I just said. God is both God, Father, and Son. He is the Father, He is the Son. They are not two people. Have you forgotten He is the Almighty? I am what I am. I will be He said, they knew me by this name. But, but by this name, they knew me not. Why do you think Moses kept crying? Oh God, I want to see your face. Show me your face. What Moses was asking is, I want to see the incarnation. I want to see the visible appearance of God. And God told him, no, you can't see me now. And then the King James says, no man will see me and live. No, the original say, when you see me, you will live. But you can't see me now. But once you see me, you will leave. That's what he means. That's the original Hebrew lexicon. But the King James, because of syntax problem, said, nobody, the day you see me, you die. No. It is when you see me, you leave. Because there's no death in him. There's only life in him. When you see him, you leave. And at the incarnation, God became a man. And he was born. He walked upon the face of the earth. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. When he moved, it was God walking on earth in humanity. And then he died. But I have news for you. Before he died, he spoke about his death. Before he died, he told you the program. He laid out for you the schedule, the, the program, the plan, and all that will happen through the mouth of the prophets and through the drama and the typology of Moses. He kept dramatizing, showing you what was going to happen. So when he was about to die, he was not afraid to die. And he didn't need help for resurrection because within him is the sufficiency to rise he died according to the scripture he rose according to the scripture he ascended according to the scripture he seated today according to the scripture and I have news for you in his resurrection he brought many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering if you believe that stand on your feet and shout glory and today, as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become what? The sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. Brother Paul will say, I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That dream of God having a family became a reality in God being the son. That dream of God having a family became a reality in God being the son. And in his son, he produced his family. And he now wanted to live inside his sons. I will live in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God. They will be my sons and my daughters. So in order for that to come to pass, the son became the spirit. 
I am what I am. I will be what I will be to fulfill my purpose. So if I have to be a son, I, God, will be the son. If I have to be a spirit, I, God, will be the spirit. But I am sufficient. I'm not depending on anybody to make it happen. All that I need is inside me. I have son inside me. I have spirit inside me. I have father inside me. And today he has brought many sons. And those sons are standing in this building. Where are the sons? Where are the sons? Where is the family of God? Go ahead and give him a praise in the building. Go ahead and give him a praise in the building. If you pray some more and celebrate some more. Celebrate your reality some more. Rejoice some more. Now are we the sons of God. Praise God forevermore. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know. I am no meheta. We know that when we shall see him, we shall be as he is. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Glory to God. 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 Glory! You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, Satan did not know. <laughs> hey, when Jesus resurrected, Satan did not know. There are many things Satan did not know. Number one, he didn't know that the person he was killing was Jesus. Because I will be what I will be. They knew me by this name, but didn't know me by this name. Because I will be what I will be. So I came out in a form the devil didn't know. And the devil facilitated my death. And it helped me to achieve my plan for a family. When Jesus rose, Satan didn't know. He didn't know when he killed Jesus that it was Jesus. And he didn't know when Jesus rose. They were still going around announcing that Jesus has not risen. Jesus rose, appeared to Mary. If you observe, he appeared to selected people. He didn't appear to everybody. So they didn't know. Satan thought Jesus was finished. He didn't know until the day of Pentecost. Satan didn't know Jesus has risen all that period of teaching after resurrection. He only got to know that this Jesus that said he will die and rise has risen on the day of Pentecost. When he saw men, one, two, three, four, five. Ah, I thought I had one to deal with, but they have multiplied their number. And I have news for you today. We are billions all over the world, filled with the Spirit of God. All over the world, the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Glory! If your spirit feel tongue talking, fire baptized holy ghost overshadowed can i have some amen in the building lift your right hands to heaven father thank you for your word thank you for the efficacy of your word thank you for the revelation of your word your word growing big on our inside revelation knowledge growing big on our inside until nothing else matters barriers terminated obstacles terminated Whatever is not planted by God, rooted out. The revelation of your word keeps growing. Our hearts keep being enlarged. Lord, we are enriched in all things. And I decree and declare that this day, your word rules and reigns over our hearts and minds. Thank you, Father. And we decree that as your word keeps coming, your people continue to grow and abound in all knowledge and in all judgment. We walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. We are fruitful unto every good work. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. Are we blessed this morning?